it's good to have you here this morning. We're starting a four-week series on prayer. Before I get going, uh, maybe a couple of words of uh, instruction. You might say, purchase fish hooks. Well, we're asking for a donation that goes directly to Keith and the projects there, and they are in the foyer. And so if you'd like to do that, you can write it on an offering envelope or whatever that this is what it's for. There's an envelope there. You can stick some money in and take a fish hook. Secondly, we want video evidence that's unedited. (laughs) Now, some of you I know are pretty good with those filters and those phones. And uh, you know the angle. You, You guys that are doing all the social media, you know what angle to make things, you know, look the right... And so we want some kind of, uh, you know, honest competition here. And uh, Pete, we thought we could get a prize for the smallest fish for you. If, that, if, that was, if you'd like, we could figure something out. Um, but no, it'll be a lot of fun. So if you're an ice fisherman or you're getting ready for spring fishing, uh, it has to be that lure that landed it. And uh, we'll see what happens. It'll be fun. We'll give updates as they go along. Uh, There's something else I was going to highlight. Chris Nickel told me to. I've never listened to him well. (laughs) Ah, work is worship. Uh, If you're wondering, how do I sign up for that? The information's all on our website. But you go to Right Now Media and sign up. And we need you to sign up because we want to have coffee and muffins and just be prepared for you here. It's going to be a great time together. That's still a few weeks off. Let's pray and we'll get to work. Lord, thank you for your word. It's true. And as uh, we just take a few minutes today, it's been good to be together already, to be reminded of how you are working, celebrate baptisms, to uh, pray for others and know that you're working in different places and uphold Keith and Melanie to begin with a song of praise, and Lord, now as we turn our attention to your word, uh, give us ears to hear, give us eyes to see, meet with us as we have communion, and then release us to express back to you the worship you deserve. Lord, renew and restore and refocus us today. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. As I was thinking about this series, and I, I, you know, admittedly, I've preached on the topic of prayer over the 20, blah, blah, seven years that I've been doing this or more. Um, there's all kinds of theological starts and all kinds of places we could go. And uh, somebody asked me something not that long ago where they said, like, you know, pr- is prayer a command or an invitation? It, because it seems that we don't, we, we don't do well with both of those things. And I said, well, it's both an instruction. It's, it's an essential part of our walk with God. And it's an invitation that we, we kind of don't believe. Uh, partly because of our earthly experience, where we kind of tend to believe that someone that important or, or someone that powerful is really wanting us, like they really care about our trivial problems. They really want to talk back to us. They're not just telling us what to do. And so Jesus was really clear, you know, he talked about it, when you pray, the practice of the people of God was to communicate with God. And there's multiple, multiple passages that we can unpack and that we'll go through talking about this idea that we can boldly enter, we can go to God and he hears us and he responds and that he invites us to do that. You know, his invitation, come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden, Uh, has meant a lot to me in these last days. Doesn't it seem like out there in society, we we just kind of are weary of all that's going on, a little bit burdened about what we're supposed to do and how it's supposed to resolve. And and his invitation is, my burden is light, my yoke is easy, come to me. He says, in everything that you face, even the little stuff, even the lost keys, or just not sure if I could shovel that much more snow one more time. How am I going to throw it high enough on the pile? But he says in everything, by prayer and supplication in Philippians, come to me. Let your request be made known to God. Hebrews 4.16 talks about a confidence with which we can approach this whole topic. It says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. 
And so I want you over this next month to just have open ears and say, renew in me, Lord. Even if some of this is things you've known or some of the, yeah, I knew that, Bob, or yeah. One of the gospel writers, I think it's Peter, or is it in 1st, 2nd John, where he says, I continue to remind you, I continue to remind you, because the human condition is such that we begin to forget. We begin to become accustomed. We begin to need that renewal, that reminder, that refreshing. And so I've gone to the gospel of um, Mark, or Luke, I'm sorry. We will be in Mark in a minute. Luke chapter 11, and uh, it's a little different than what you would know as the Lord's Prayer found in Matthew chapter 6. But let's read it together, verses 1 to 11, and then we'll get started. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each daily, each day our daily bread. And forgive our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who's indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, don't bother me, the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Now, the very first thing I want to talk about as we look into this passage is that verse number one. And verse number one talks about Jesus um, praying in a certain place. And we know that Jesus has just returned to the disciples after being set apart to spend some time with the Father. And we know that this was his practice. Uh, it's just a, a cursory run through Scripture. You, you could go to Matthew chapter 14, verses 23. You know the setting. Um, the disciples have been really tired, and they came back to Jesus. John the Baptist has been killed. And he says, come away with me, and the crowds follow them, and there's nothing for them to eat. Remember this? He teaches all day. And he feeds the 5,000, and he sends the disciples off across the lake on a boat, and he retreats by himself to be with the Father and to pray. In Luke 6, 12, it says that he was up the whole night, retreated with the Father, spending time in prayer, and it was after that that he chose his disciples. And in Luke 5, 16, it says this, this is a direct quote, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. And so as students of, as followers of the rabbi, as, as his disciples, as he's passing down information, he's modeling something for them. He's modeling that what's essential is this retreating to be with the Father that's intentional and this praying. They're observing it. And uh, the disciples come to him and say, uh, hey, could, could you teach us to do that? Now, I was telling the worship team earlier, or the team that is doing all the tech and everything, I am just human enough and weird enough that this set me to thinking. If I was going to ask Jesus to teach me something, I think it might be, could you teach me to raise people from the dead? <laughs> That'd be cool. Or the fish that had the coin in the mouth. I mean, you get money and food all at the same time. I'd like to repeat that one over and over. Uh, what about that whole uh, distribution of food? Like, there's miracles like crazy. 
And the disciples recognize something really, really interesting. That the source of the power, the connection, comes somehow from his relationship with the Father. That if we could learn to do this, everything else would fall into place. It'd be amazing what would happen. And so it's super interesting to see that they would know that Jesus' power, that, that, that he came in the name of the Father. And as they've seen him take power over the elements and, and just speak and the wind calm down and, and all of that, the wisdom Jesus had. He would retreat to be with the Father and, and he would come back and, and they would know that he retreated for 40 days to fast and pray and, and then faced the temptation. And he, I used to think Satan came when he was at his lowest, but maybe it was when he was the closest to the Father, the easiest able to spot it, the most connected. We see when he comes back from praying and they're looking for him and ministry is cooking. I mean, they've traveled from all over. The sick have come to be healed. Everybody's gathered around and they say, Jesus, you know, they're waiting for you. Where are you? And say, we're going over here today. And we know that the leading in how he taught, he says, I only say and do what the Father tells me to say and do. They say, teach us that. And I don't want you to see this as a pattern that we just repeat. Uh, there's a difference between this passage and the passage in, Math- in uh, Matthew 6. And, uh, you know, you'll notice that they, there's a few other things that, that are added to the Lord's Prayer. And it's recorded differently from the Gospel writer. But this is what we call a guide to get started. And there's more and more and more that fleshes out in Scripture. And over these next weeks, we're going to look further into it. But let's walk through what he says to them as he teaches them how to pray. He starts by suggesting prayer is an action, not simply an attitude. Ever hear this? Um, Yeah, I just, all the time I'm just kind of talking to Jesus. It could be true. And we'll get into 1 Thessalonians 16 in a minute, but it looks for all the world like Jesus set apart time, like there was moments of the day, that there was a rhythm to things where there was intentional conversation with God. I'm coming away to be with you, to converse with you. It wasn't just breathed out as day goes on. That doesn't invalidate that. But he says, say, there's an action here. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, it It has that rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We know that verse very well and yet the without ceasing, it seems in the Greek would be better suggested not that it's constant but that it's over and over and over and it's intentional and that it's not without giving up, without stopping, without abandoning the process. And so it's don't quit, persist, be regular, be consistent in your intentionality to communicate with the Father. Next, I want you to notice that he tells them it's a family privilege, our Father. Now, I would fully admit that all of us are made in the image of God, but not everyone is a child of God. There's a difference. So while you're made in the image and likeness of God and he wishes that none perish, he went to amazing lengths that you might have relationship with him. And he sent his son who lived sinlessly, who went to the cross, and it says this in John 1, 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, this is kind of an important point to camp on for just a minute because I hear this all the time uh, from non-believing people. They don't believe Jesus was the way they have relationship with God. And they send up prayers, they, good thoughts. They think that positive energy is going to change something or help. 
And as Jesus teaches them to pray, he starts with the word father, and it speaks specifically of a relationship, right? And I want you to see that prayer that God listens to and responds to is a family privilege. And the power of that prayer, I mean, it comes from relationship. It's the relationship with the Father. 1 Peter 3.12 says this, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And I just want to pause there again, because in my lawyer head, um, where I'm so aware of myself, uh, I say, are you really righteous, Bob? Have you done enough that God would listen to you, that his eyes would be on you, that his ears would be open to your prayer? Is there anything there that, listen, where does our righteousness come from? Isn't it imputed from Jesus? Doesn't God see us through that? And you need to deal with willful areas of sin in your life, but listen to what it says. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. That means that you stand right before him because of what Christ has done. And his ears are open to their prayer. It's a family privilege. And you stand there because God enabled it to happen. And then it says, hallowed be your name. It starts with a perspective. Who is the father that we're coming to? The almighty God. Creator of all things. The one who sustains. The one who provides. So Jesus says, start here. Be intentional. Say, our Father, that's a family privilege, it's a relationship, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He goes on to uh, talk about your agenda be done. This is really interesting. Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your agenda be done. Ever think about this? This is like a point of really evaluating who's going to be on the throne and speaking it of my life. Uh, How many of you have kids that like to give you their agenda? (laughs) Some of you are like, oh yeah. Or a spouse. You know how you kind of bristle at that. There's this point of recognizing who God is and coming to the Father and saying, your, your will be done. Now, that's an easy statement generically, but let's break it down. Let's start talking about in my life. See, I have all these wants and desires and these things I'm after, and, and I'm willing to actually elevate your will above my desire. I'm, I'm really actually willing to submit that desire to you And I know you know better than I do. Your will be done in my life. You be on the throne. In essence, can you really pray? Your way, not mine. How about this? Your will be done in my family. Are you willing to hold those kids, those aging parents, those spouses and open hands to God? Your will be done. I want you to do your work in their lives. In my community, my neighborhood, my place of work, I'm here for you to use. I'm here, your will be done. Your will be done in our country, in our world. You've put me in this place, in this time, in this season. Our Father, hallowed be your name. Your will be done in me in my circumstances, in my loved ones, in the place you have me, in our world. Your agenda be done. And then I have needs that only you can meet. Give us each day our daily bread. And as I think about that and pull that back, I think about the needs that I come to him with all the time. 
I need no more snow. (laughs) How about your physical needs? Food, rest, shelter, health, right? He's inviting you to come and to say, um, give us this day our daily bread. It's more than, more than just food. It's, it's all of these things I'm going to face today physically. And then I called it spiritual provision. Where he says, uh, forgive and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who's indebted to us. The recognition that we're sinners and that we rely on the cross and that only God through his provision of Jesus could forgive sin is an important one. And it's this reminder back that says, forgive us our sin. We have a spiritual need that only you can meet. And you have met it. And it's a reminder. And then because, notice the order of this, because of the magnitude of what God's done for us, it's really, really clear that we need to be a people who forgive others. And Matthew ties it way more closely, forgive us as we forgive, right? And this is a massive issue in our lives. And so he's saying, as you come to the Father and you communicate with the Father, here's a pattern, here's a, here's a template, an outlay. You don't have to pray this specifically, but here's the themes to walk through. Putting God in the right place and and saying, this is, I come to you, your agenda be done, and, and I have needs only you can meet, and I need to be forgiven, and I need strength to forgive others, because we walk around wounding each other, don't we? We walk around being wounded by things. And it's when we come back to remembering what God has done for us, that it gives us what we need to do for others. And then finally, protection. Protection. It says, lead us not into temptation. The ability to see and to resist temptation because we have an enemy that loves to destroy and to trip us up in trials and in struggle. And then in this passage, Jesus tells the most interesting story. And I just titled it Perseverance. He talks about a friend going to somebody else's house and it's a Middle Eastern culture, and I know it, we don't get it as much. Midnight would have been the middle of the night. They go to sleep more when the dark comes, and they get up when it's light. And uh, in Middle Eastern culture, you get guests come to you. You really want to be hospitable and put some food in front of them, and, and that would have been a responsibility, something that would have been big. And you go to your friend, and you know he's trying to borrow some bread to do it. But it's his insistence that Jesus refers to. It's the perseverance. It takes me to Luke chapter 18. Uh, verses 1 to 8, he tells a parable about this very thing. Let's read it. He told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not to lose heart. He said in In a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while, he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down in her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes... Will he find faith on earth? We are going to dive deeply into God's invitation to pester him. I, uh, I said to my dad when I was talking to him, I said, this is what it feels like to me, that we, because we have earthly fathers, what did it mean when you looked at me and said, ask me again? <laughs> it wasn't good. 
It wasn't good. Like if I was bugging him, if I was asking him for something, if I was persisting and he said, ask me one more time, it was not a good thing. And yet we seem to serve a heavenly father who says, come, I, I just desire to spend time. I want you to pester me. I want you to keep asking. I want you to persist. I want you to practice this. Let's ask the big question. So what? As a family, uh, those of us that have a relationship with God, prayer is not an unheard of thing. It, and it is both an invitation and it is filled with instruction. It's not like, hey, would you like to do this? It's you need to learn to do this. This is where the power comes. This is where the connectedness comes. This is where the relationship is maintained and developed. God talks to his people and he wants to hear from them. No, we're going to cover some of the lies in the days ahead. It's not too trivial. You're not too far. It's, he longs to be with you this way. And we, the scripture just over and over and over calls us to that. We need to be connected to power, and that is that when we come to God, there's a promise to be heard. The instruction in Scripture over and over as it talks about the, the church in Acts is that they were devoted to this and that they were constant in it and that God continually invites them to persist in asking and coming before him. As a family, we need to understand that is for us. And if there is ever a season and a time that this has application and, and wheels and, and that we need to be that place of power and that place where we're devoted to this, where our will becomes second and God's way becomes first, it's now. Secondly, I want you to know that this is a muscle that you have to use, a spiritual discipline to be developed. Uh, I know I'm talking a lot about the snow lately. For those of you watching that don't have it, too bad. Um, how many of you had, when you start throwing snow higher and higher, that that muscle was fully formed and fully worked out, not sore? Anyone? You, anybody like me? I was like, am I getting old? He comes, oh, my back. Spiritual disciplines, prayer, and, and you, know, you think about these kids, you, you hear some of the babies trying to talk, and parents begin to understand them because they're, uh, they speak a language I don't speak. But we don't get mad at them if they get a word wrong, and we, we want them to babble, and we want them to try, and, and the invitation is to begin to come and be intentional about being with the Father and learning to hear His voice. And expressing yourself. And you've got a pattern you can follow. You've got things you can do. But it's a muscle that needs to be exercised and developed. Scripture is just filled with examples and instruction on how to do that. And rhythms that work. And all of us struggle to find this intentional time. Well, when am I going to find a quiet space? I mean, people are after me all the time. And then... How do I practice it? I, does God really hear? Does he really care? The answer is yes. And it needs to be an area of growth and reminder in our lives. And if some of you today are dealing with guilt, going, oh, I know this, and I remember what it's like, and ah, I've gotten away from it, that's not something you should feel guilty about. That's something you should be drawn back to obedience in. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Says, I'm sorry, Lord. Help me respond and draw into this. And so the challenge to renew this in your life as the next season is before you. And instead of just walking through all of it, I'm just going to send the simple outline home with you today. We're going to practice here for just a couple minutes in preparation to communion. And then... My challenge for you is to look into your prayer life, look into your communication with God, look into your intentionality, and say, I need to begin to advance that, to pay attention to that. What, does it, what happens when the people of God humble themselves and pray? 
What happens when we begin to practice that discipline corporately as a group? Well, the stories we're going to see in the next days is that it moves the hand of God and amazing things happen.